Uh, Miles is the uh, master of growth and Jim is the master in M&A. So uh, please direct any of your uh, questions or otherwise to, uh, to those <coughs> on those topics to each of them respectively. Um, but uh, to kick off uh, in this era where <coughs> M&A is going to take on a different uh, guise, I'm going to hand over to Miles, who's going to set up about uh, how we approach growth in the uh, in the coming months and years to come. And then uh, he'll hand over to Jim, who will talk about the changing landscape of the M&A world. Cool. Thanks, Clive. Um, just to sort of um, add to the um, intro, um, as, uh, as Clive mentioned, I, I run the sort of growth advisory side of Waypoint, which is um, sort of more board advisory in terms of helping businesses to get to where they want to get to. And that generally is some kind of uh, shareholder uh, value event. Um, so it's about building value um, so that the business builds value and also uh, realises that value through the corporate finance and M&A side. Both, both Jim and I have, um, have also run agencies that might be <clears throat> relevant to the audience here is that we've all all the partners at Waypoint have got um, backgrounds in in either digital or, or non-digital agency world um, I for example um, uh, ran a business called Digitas in London which I was CEO of for quite a few years um, and uh, Jim will talk about his experiences uh, as a CFO um, in the US at a business, business called 160 over 90 which took um, substantial um, private equity investment so um Hopefully, we sort of walked in your shoes. We'll have some, hopefully, relevant um, uh, insights to, to bring to the table. We, we probably work also with about uh, 40 to 50 um, agencies currently across the UK, uh, US, and, and the north of England and Scotland. So uh, we've got that sort of geographical split um, and insights there, um, and obviously insights from the different businesses where we're working with there. So um, I, I thought I'd probably start off with you know, how, how are businesses that we see at the moment um, rebuilding that value um, and how are they approaching uh, working with their, with their clients? I think the first thing to say is that <clears throat> this is going to be a, a prolonged period. I mean, depending on what, you know, current research you, you see in terms of how the economy might recover, um, Ernst & Young produced quite a, an insightful piece uh, probably over a week ago now, which um, had three potential rebounds that the, the economy might take. I think one was called the V-shape, one was called the W-shape, where there was a, another peak of infection, followed by um, another rebound. Um, and the third was a what they call tick, which was a gradual clawback um, in stages over the next sort of six to 12 months. So um, there are various scenarios out there, but I think the thing to say really is that it's going to be a prolonged period. So it's not just a, a now thing. It's going to be, well, what do I need to do with my clients over the next, say, three to six to nine months to, um, to really lean in and be more competitive? So um, it's not a sort of snapshot. It's something you're going to have to sustain o over a period of time. Um, there, there is a strategy, and I, I was on a call the other day, and uh, one of the agencies on there was talking about just hunkering down and, and doing nothing and waiting for the market to come back. Uh, I, I, think, I think that sort of absence of a, a plan or strategy is a very bad one. Um, I think if you are on the back foot and at the behest of your clients making decisions without you, then it's, you're not in control. And the, the likelihood is that the decision will go against you rather than, than for you. So... I'd say don't be passive. Um, the, the same client actually spoke up, not a client, so I prospect st uh, spoke up on this call and said, look, um, I'm worried about engaging with my clients at the moment because I'm worried about if I start to sort of stir the hornet's nest, um, I might stir up some things I don't want to hear um, and decisions might go against me. But my response to that is, well, if you're not in control of that conversation and leading it, then it most likely will. So, um, so definitely lean in to clients. And I think that being on the front foot is, um, is a very good idea at the moment. Um, now, how to do that, that's, that's interesting. Um, I'd say overall, the philosophy needs to be that you need to try and understand what the brands, your clients are, uh, what their recovery plans are. Um, and if you don't know it, you've got to try and find out. I think with, with clients at the moment, there's a, 
hesitancy to make decisions because they don't know um, what's happening. They don't have enough information to reduce the risk to be able to make a decision. So the more information you can give a client um, about their sector, about how others, others are performing, about who's winning, who's losing at the moment in terms of what the strategies need to be for the clients, the more you can do of that, the better, because that decision-making process comes down to a point where a client can feel they can make a decision, even if it's just partial, um, partial spend coming back, at least they can make a decision and, and, uh, and make one with certainty. And quite often your client will need to write a, a brief business plan to be able to do that with, with the economic buyer within the business. So help them to formulate what that business plan might be, um, help them understand how uh, re-establishing spend or doing things differently or a new product or service you can, you can give them will be able to, um, to help in, in formulating that decision and getting that, uh, that spend back. So those are a few things I, I would certainly do. And I think overall, just keep your client informed um, uh, as much as possible because information is really king at the moment. The more information you have, the better informed and more likely your, your spend is to come back to, to where it was before. So those are a few things, Clive. I think the other thing to mention that's working a lot really well with clients I'm hearing at the moment is um, to be able to get in front of them, even if it's a sort of one of those quarterly you know, review meetings, strategy, strategy review meetings, is to present um, scenarios of now, next, and normal, and just outlining how those scenarios might change over the next period. I think that, that's gone down very well with a few of my clients that are using that with their clients at the moment. Um, it just helps to frame how the situation may change, how spend might change, and how the agency's services might adapt to those different scenarios. So I think in terms of client, that's probably the main things that I'd be thinking of at the moment. Okay, <clears throat> we'll have some Q&A, so we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A on, on all of this, um, on this Mars. But just one question I've got now is in terms of what does the uh, future agency model look like out coming out of COVID? Because everyone's talking about the new reality. What yeah, um, I think there's a, there's a few things we're seeing at the moment. I think um, there's certainly a propensity to... Uh, to try and seek more partnerships. Um, now, there's various reasons for that. One is it gives you access to more opportunities. So what, one of my clients, for example, is a, a brand strategy business uh, focused on the retail market. Um, so fairly niche, um, but very highly strategic. And they've partnered with a big creative US business that doesn't have that capability over there. So. For, for the bigger agency in the US, there's an advantage there of developing a new capability with reduced risk, um, being able to offer more to their clients and potentially getting more of the RFP um, within, their, within their confines. Um, and clearly for my client, there's access to opportunity, uh, a perception of increased scale um, and a foothold in the US. So I think it makes a lot of sense for a number of levels. Um, and you know, if, if there are either services or extensions of services or different types of businesses that you could partnership with, partner with that makes sense and doesn't dilute your proposition too much, then, then it's, it's a very good way of, um, you know, appearing bigger and getting access to more budget. So that, that's the first I'd say. I think um, the other one is, I guess, and it has been going for a while, it's just more of a, a flexibility in your, in your engagement model with your clients. Um, there's a sort of philosophy of this expert bench where you know, brands are looking to, to sort of ha harness the, the, the capabilities and the specialties that the agency have. And often why people use agencies is because they're very up to date. They've got, you know, uh, people want to work there because they get more variety of work and therefore the skill set is probably seen as being higher but they don't always want to engage in a traditional sort of agency model. So being flexible about that, um, that uh, resource engagement, I think is, is another key one there. Um, uh, another one might be, um, and I've seen this a couple of times in the last couple of weeks now, is where brands have got a hold on um, additional headcount for their own teams. So they've been asking um, my clients whether they can put people in to to the to the brand to work there now clearly you don't want to set a precedent of being a, a recruitment shop for your clients but it's a massive opportunity to a increase spend b get closer uh, c 
you know, get better to decision making processes and information from the client and to really embed yourself in there. Um, but I'd say that the way to do that really is to probably um, present it as a service rather than a, a person. So you get out of the trap of just, you know, the client asks for more, more work from you rather than them asking for more people, they're asking for, you know, more services from you. So there's, there's a few traps there and there's a whole cultural piece around, you know, people going native. But um, if you can get around all those things, and I think you can, that, that's a fantastic opportunity. So maybe that is something you can, you know, if, if your client is hamstrung in, um, in not having a big enough team there around, you can supplement them by putting people in. <clears throat> I think that's an excellent idea. Um, other thing I'm seeing is, um, you know, obviously a, a greater willingness to use freelance. I think that's been, been very much proven over the last couple of years anyway, that, you know, freelancers work really well and it's a really burstable um, resource to have. But the whole working from home thing has made, um, you know, team working remotely much more palatable and acceptable. So I think that's probably going to open up a whole lot of opportunity in terms of um, talent that you can access that isn't necessarily geographically you know, located or linked anymore. So before I think a lot of business would have said, well, I want someone in London or I want someone in you know, this area. I think probably people will be a lot more flexible about where those people are now. They're used to working um, you know, all, predominantly online. So I think that's an advantage because that talent pool um, massively opens up. Um, and I think the other trend I'm seeing at the moment is um, just, you know, businesses being sensible about how they're pitching their work and they're pitching it much more in terms of um, bite size, you know, products, um, you know, easy to buy services and products and, and sort of smaller, more bite sized things that are easier to buy. Um, so that's definitely been a trend that I've seen um, certainly over the last two to three weeks now. Um, and it's something I'm advising my clients to, to really think about because it's no point just sort of, you know, presenting the same thing you've been presenting before. Um, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be thinking about flexibility, relevance of what you're offering, timeliness of what you're offering and the status of where your clients actually ask the moment. Some have just sort of put their head above the parapet and are sort of looking at, you know, where the landscape now lies. Some are still locked down. Others are much more bullish um, and are much more thinking about, you know, what's happening next, you know, how to be more competitive when the market picks up again. So uh, there's a lot of nuance around your own business there, but certainly um, I think that, you know, um, that sort of packaging of your services needs a lot of thought. So I think that's probably it at the moment, Clive, in terms of that <laughs> model. It, it clearly will develop over the next few months um, as things develop, but uh, those are sort of the trends that I'm seeing across the, the client base at the moment. Okay, <clears throat> we'll come on later to a uh, reduction in, um, in fixed overheads because office space is clearly a, a, <clears throat> a big topic at the moment. Um, but we'll come back to that after uh, Jim has uh, introduced us to the, uh, the new realities of M&A, which uh, I kind of like to paraphrase as being more about M than A, but. Uh, you might well prove me wrong, Jim. Yeah, <clears throat> well, let's let's see what I can do. And I, I, Clive, if, I, if I ramble too much, um, stop me and shut me up and give me a question to get me back on track again. I, I was going to start by talking about, um, uh, we get, we're getting asked a lot of questions that, that are kind of relatively similar in nature by, you know, all, fr from all parts of the market, buyers, sellers, UK, overseas. Um, the one that comes up the most at the moment, there are others as well, but the, 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 the biggest one, the most recurrent theme is what's this going to mean in three months? What will it mean in six months? You know, what is it going to look like in a year's time? And, you know, two or three years down the track, does it look different again? And I think the continuum of time is really, really important. So maybe if I do a, if I do a kind of what I think the next three and six months might look like for us and, and this is based on I've had the misfortune of experiencing the 1987 slump uh, A-level student at the time I should hasten to add not actually in business 1991 uh, I, I, I was actually doing storyboards at an agency in the Golden Square in 98 well, not not M&C or as then was but I was, I was an artist of those days so that kind of killed my summer job 2001 with the economic collapse and 9-11 and, and, and no one being able to travel that was kind of interesting because I was the Omnicom m and guy at the time that made life a bit challenging and then um, my advisory career started out in the middle of the post Lehman's uh, collapse so I, I've seen a number of these things along the way and, and you know I suppose the next question really is are any of those reference points actually any use 
you try and kind of put all those things together, stitch them together, and what do they tell you about what might be happening now? But uh, they all affected business activity levels, consumer confidence levels. They they all affected marketing spend. So I suppose they're all relevant to a degree. But th this one is a you know sort of nine eleven rapidity of impact and and all the pain of a sort of 1930s Great Depression by by all the kind of predictive forecasting that's going on. So it's a tricky one. I think what you can, what you can absolutely see now as uh, the, the situation, processes that we, we have either seen or involved in or, or are close to uh, UK and, and US, where processes are pretty advanced, where that piece of um, confidence and mutual understanding is already established between buyer and seller, they're, they're, sort of, they're, they're generally continuing. But that piece of trying to build confidence and knowledge about each other when you know the business and people's you know, priorities change on a daily basis at, at the moment and where you can't physically get people in a room um that that's really challenging so if you're kind of pre-relationship build we're seeing most of those processes being put on pause most but not all and i'll explain in, in, a, in a second some of the exceptions and, and that's generally happening both on the supply side and on demand side. You know, most buyers in this industry and some of this industry now, I suppose, is more technology and IP based than it would have been in one of those prior recessions. But fundamentally, it's a, it's a relationship business. And so M&A is about confidence and trust. And if as a buyer or, or as a seller, I do a bad deal now, or actually isn't a bad deal now, but in 12 months time, when the world feels different, it suddenly feels like a bad deal. That will unravel really quickly and all the experience we've all got says that that's the case so both buyers and sellers but mainly buyers are really wary about getting into transactions that could be seen as opportunistic or badly priced with the benefit of hindsight because at the moment you can't really pick so uh, they're being very cautious so early stage process generally being turned off um, having said that we we started a process about two weeks ago with a london hq business that's a sort of international organization because it's the right time for them uh, inbound approaches a kind of business model that's absolutely right for the market and uh, and and it was it's the right time for a number of different reasons uh, and actually the buyer audience for that kind of transaction where you've got a clearly demonstrable logical business case for why the deal and why the timing is, is playing out pretty well at the kind of conceptual level We've got a lot of people who are managing to find a way to engage with us. But the thing that no one has tried to do, I think, ever prior to this uh, crisis is try and build relationships and trust, fundamental ones around shareholder value and people's businesses, careers, livelihoods, without actually physically being in a room together. And I think you know, a process that's starting now that might conclude in, say, three months time genuinely there's a likelihood that that will happen without buyer and seller, seller ever actually physically meeting and I don't think anyone's ever done that before so each day on that process we are having to work out how we can build that kind of human relationship dynamic but without having people in a room so it's a very practical challenge I think that's the biggest um, constraint to supply and demand side right now M most most buyers uh, both private equity and strategics are are assuming that yeah based on what they're hearing from the from, from the government and, and and press in terms of economic recovery the m a world gets back to something like normal in about six months time but but and this is probably a slightly uncharitable comment but it's one it's a pretty widely held view amongst the buyer uh world there are a lot of people running agencies around the world right now who started running those agencies after 2009 and those, therefore, those people, although they might be, they might have had frustrations around dealing with procurement departments and a kind of rapidly shifting marketing services world. There are a lot of people running quite big, quite established, quite successful agencies who've never traded through real organisational risk and stress. And that therefore, about six months from now, a whole bunch of people sitting on top quartile businesses in their own respective sectors will have got pretty sensitised to risk. We'll have a different view, Clive, as you said, around what a transaction needs to look like. Does, is it more an M than an A? And people will be more open-minded, they'll be more risk aware, and they will therefore have a different pricing expectation because there's also a view amongst the 
buyer community that in the last two years pricing has got a bit inflated and this is a chance for it to to reset so there'll be a kind of difficult period for sellers in about six months time where the market will have reopened but buyers may not be seeing it the same way as sellers i think you know 12 months from now we might all feel like we're in basically back to normal transactions the, the practical consideration then will be there's going to be an enormous amount of pent up supply and demand that would have accumulated over about a nine month period, which will mean in the same way that the banks at the moment are struggle, struggling processing all the various different lending applications. There's going to be so much m and that's trying to get done that it'll be very, very difficult to kind of pick people out from the noise. Uh, when I was back at Omnicom a long time ago now, we, we'd see, you know, upwards of 100 opportunities, good opportunities a year. You, <laughs> Imagine you having the sort of hundred opportunities to compress into a, into a quarter. You can't possibly cope with that. So I think to Mars's point around every having a strategy, people thinking about shareholder events in the next 12 months need to think about how they get ahead of that unblocking of the market. And if they're not ahead of it, they've got to think about how they're very, very clearly distinct from others if they're going out at the same time, because that's going to be the big practical challenge, I think. Okay. <coughs> um the uh, whilst I was on to uh, you, Jim, just this idea in terms of mergers, there are going to be a number of uh, mm. businesses that are going to be severely weakened by all of this um, and uh, might well be looking for a marriage of convenience. Um, how do you avoid that? I don't know. Is the question, should you avoid that? Or is it how, how we know? How do you avoid? I, I, I wonder, and I think, I and mean, this is a topic I'm sure it's been debated at length over the last you know, decade or two, that, that probably, probably pre-Accenture, I, I think one of the things that I most disliked about the arrival of Accenture on the scene, a whole bunch of different things, but the one I disliked the most was the concept that when I've been a buyer, people would only ever sell if their brand was being looked after, if they had cultural independence, operating independence, decision-making autonomy, and then suddenly a new face shows up on the block and, it, and basically buys people outright for a sum of money. And the rules are, we bought you and therefore you kind of need to do what you need to do. And until then, you would always talk about yeah, in, independence. Uh, but, but since the Accenture mold breaking m a activity i think people have kind of have woken up to a different kind of you know that that did wake people up to a different kind of uh, m a transaction albeit it was priced in a way that you could be a bit less sensitive about cultural sacrifices when it was accenture i think the, mer the merger thing never used to seem to get off the ground because people would look at who's in charge whose business in it is it if we're rolling up our equity together do i feel more confident sitting on a smaller stake of a bigger business where I'm not in control versus in control of my, my smaller business. And I think in this current market, you know, marriages of convenience, I um, scale is definitely a function of, uh, or a part of this, but if you've got more risk diversification, there's got to be a premium worth paying for having that. And if, in, in my mind, if you, if you can find a way of testing the cultural match and the strategic match and the alignment of shareholder ambitions, I'm not sure that you should be avoiding mergers, to be honest, in the next 12 months. I, I think the right kinds of mergers um, could, could, be, could, be where we, could be where we see the majority of activity in the market, and they could be the right outcomes. Better access to capital, e easier access to buyers down the track for the ultimate liquidity event. You know, buyers get higher value on their acquisition dollars for larger deals. That's just kind of basic maths. And more resilience along the way. I, I think we'll see a lot of mergers and I think they'll be for good reason. I'm not sure that people should be avoiding them. Okay. I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, these, these deals for a sum of cash. I think you said sum of money, actually. Um, clearly, uh, money is in short supply and therefore paper is greater. Um, is, that the, is that the better way in terms of doing those kind of mergers where it's about paper and... Um, and there isn't, uh, so there's more shared endeavour. Mm. I, th I think that's right. I mean, again, practical realism is going to be pretty difficult to put together any, any kind of merger or any kind of you know, bigger roll-up type um, activity without some cash being available just because that kind of process costs money to deliver. 
you're not going to pay your lawyers in shares. So you, there's actually yeah, cash has to be available somewhere along the way. And I, and I think for most people going into a merger or a consolidation, they will they will have worked out along the way because you know merger is going to take three, four plus months to put together if it's being done properly. People will have worked out who the chief exec's going to be. Maybe not on day one, but twelve months down the track, someone will no longer be the boss. And I think in doing that, the the person who is stepping down their control or the people stepping down their control will feel like they need some kind of risk adjustment, which will be cash. But the easiest way to put that together will be a will be an equity type roll up. And I think that yeah, that's that's the way people should be thinking about it. An equity in an agency business only has really has value on an exit event anyway. There's hardly any dividend value. All your your working capital will get sucked up in in growth and and, and growing a business if you're growing it responsibly. So I think it's it's more, it's around picking the right partners and having the right process and the right strategic rigor to to do that properly. And can I ask each of you um, because many of us have been on many calls like this where we've been getting a feel for what's going on in the uh, in the industry and you've probably got uh, an even greater visibility just to kind of benchmark um we all know that you know things have fallen off the cliff what do you think is the average and i know how long is a piece of string but the average decline in business across this industry has been so when we talk about a bounce back are we talking about something where we're recovering very quickly in a v-shape or have we lost 50 percent of our of our business and it's going to take a couple of years to recover i, I think the, the dynamic of time is important in answering that so uh, i i've got uh, clients and clients for, for whom we pause processes combination of the two i'm seeing anything from a, a probably a 40 percent for this this calendar quarter for the kind of most extreme end of the spectrum, one of my clients where we have a paused process is actually having their strongest quarter ever. Um, but a paused process because practically we just cannot, we can't work out a way of engaging the parties we want to engage with in a practical sort of efficient way over the next few months. So we've just down tools. So I mean, it's not, it's not universal, but equally I can't imagine there'd be more than a tiny fraction of the community that's actually doing better in this market. And the ones that are doing better, are probably not doing better on a sustainable basis. So I would, you know, I don't know, gut feel on average, 25% down at the moment. And we're working with clients a lot on profit forecasting, cash flow forecasting, and most people, I'm looking at miles on the screen now, but most people that I'm talking to are forecasting sort of 25, 30% down for at least the next few months. And then a pretty slow, not caught, it's more of a sort of gravy boat kind of shape. I think you're steep on the front end and sort of shallow on the way out type recovery. So pretty slow and gradual from, from the dip. Yeah. Yeah, there's um, Clive, there's some very good research that came out a few weeks ago from Ernst & Young, which had three different scenarios I mentioned earlier on the way back. And the, uh, the most likely they think is this sort of tick shape, which is a sort of a gradual comeback. Um, so you've got a, a small rise, you've got then a sort of a, a plateau, then a rise again, um, coming back to normal um, levels um, in, in the winter. Um, so probably end of this year, early next. All the other forecasts are, are, are different, clearly. But um, you know, if, if, that, if that is the case, then um, I think Jim, Jim's um, sort of you know, rounding of 25 to 30% is probably about right, I think. Um, some, some sectors have, have done better social. Um, you know, a few of my social media clients have haven't had so much of an impact. Clearly, there's a lot of you know whether this is temporary or not, but a lot of increased spend uh, in certain sectors because everyone's at home. Healthcare has done pretty well as well. Um, you know, Jim mentioned crisis comms just now, equally done as well. Performance marketing is doing okay, um, probably about you know twenty percent down. Um, conversion rate optimization flourishing because brands want more from what they're spending. So that's, that's doing really well. So it's not, it's not uniform, certainly, but I think the, the other aspect to overlay this with is that there, was like, there will likely now be a faster move to digital than there was before. So that, that trend of spend going more digital will only increase um, more rapidly, I think. Um, so those that are set to benefit from that will, will 
will have a, an extra leg up if you like and that 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 slope we talked about coming back to the market will probably be uh, a bit more um, vertical for them than, than shallow. So um, I think there's opportunities in there. Okay. Um, back to you, Jim, just on a uh, question in terms of what does it take? Because um, clearly if there are things like mergers kind of going on, then you're, in my view, you're either the hunter or being hunted. Um, what does it take to be an acquirer? No, that, 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 that's a question that I like, and I think it's a question that um, is often it's it's often really misunderstood. Um, that the number of people that that I have talked to over the years who think that to be an acquirer, you need to ha have lumps of cash on your balance sheet, and that is the the overwhelming requirement. I think have always sort of fundamentally misunderstood that. There'll always be someone who can outbid you if they want to outbid you for a business. I think you always have to have more than that. Um, the, the thing that's always struck me as being the, the, the fundamental prerequisite is assuming that the desire of the seller isn't simply to exit. And that's maybe a separate question. You know, people who are just heading for the hills, I think cash is you know, clearly important. But most buyers hear a story from sellers, whether it's reality or not, which is this is about realizing aspirations and potential for my for my company and if and if that's what it's all about actually what an acquirer needs to have is strategy vision leadership and you need to have a plan it needs to have a credible plan and someone who can deliver it and it needs to have the infrastructure to allow an acquirer to um to, to sorry an acquiree to plug into it so that typically small, smaller organizations where management teams are more on the business, more in the business than on it, very occupied with operations, tend to have less time available to think about longer term strategic planning. What's our shareholder event? Who are we headed for? But I, I, it's not, it shouldn't be, I don't think it is. I think this market will prove out that it's not, it shouldn't be directly correlated to size. There will, there, will be, there will be acquirer companies, we're talking to a few right now, are relatively small businesses in a conventional sense, but they've got a clarity of plan, they've got a proposition that works and that is market fit for purpose on, on exit from this, and they've got enough calendar, uh, cash on the balance sheet that to pay advisory costs, de-risk to a degree sellers of a business, but not to the extent that they could exit. And so I think there's a whole bunch of people who in ordinary circumstances would not ever see themselves as acquirers who will either yeah, have that kind of wake up moment or people with whom they are close will come to them looking for help and will kind of put them on the spot and they will suddenly find that they are qualified to be a buyer. It just, it won't, it's not going to feel like into public buying another PR agency for Weber Shamwick. It's not going to be that kind of M&A transaction back to your sort of initial point. But I think there'll be quite a lot of creative merger type consolidation deals and the kind of stuff frankly that you've seen in the us forever i mean about half the us m a activity is that is that type it's not the buyout activity and i think the uk will just look a bit more like the us okay um and back, miles just a couple of things in terms of uh both growth and dealing with uh with clients and uh, maybe simon ryan tuck could add to this um the uh <coughs> With weakening balance sheets for agencies, which would happen, will procurement one look uh, more sparingly at, uh, at agencies when uh, negotiating? And would they alternatively look to suggesting that in housing might be a better way of and a lower risk way of doing it, or something that they could uh, they could achieve more effectively? Yeah, I think. Um... I, th I think the stress balance sheet is, is going to be an issue. I'm sure that, you know, although I haven't seen this yet, procurement will certainly be, you know, A, focusing more on costs more than anything else at the moment, but, um, but B, be more scrutinising of, um, of agencies and their financial health. And, you know, they, want, they won't want to take a supplier on who, um, you know, with a, with a weak balance sheet who, who might not be able to, to serve the clients in the way they need to be served. Um, I think that... But conversely, there's going to be opportunity also for, for agencies that are more flexible in the way they engage. Um, 
and maybe the ones that can offer more sort of value-based and performance-based pricing, which reduces the risk of procurements um, in making a decision, will probably probably um, work out a lot better. Um, so I don't I don't think it's necessarily just about the strength of the balance sheet. I think it's it's going to be um, you know one side procurement um, looking for more savings. It's agencies to try and be smarter about how they might want to um, engage through that value and performance-based pricing. Um, but also, um, I'm, I'm sure there's bound to be some consolidation as well in terms of the numbers of um, agencies that are on that supplier list. Um, a, because some won't exist anymore, some won't, some won't, be, some won't make it, um, others will take it. Well, those with strong balance sheets will try and do what they can to undermine the others um, and offer um, you know, sort of better prices to, to, um, to extend their services and, and reach. Um, so I think it'll be a mixed bag. I haven't seen anything yet. I haven't seen anything, you know, sort of supply chain side or procurement yet in terms of those moves. But um, I'm sure that once once those, um, you know, mandates go out to procurement to, um, to, to sort of save money and, and do things differently, then um, it, it will certainly happen. But I haven't seen it yet. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, Clive, on the procurement stuff, that, that I, you know, I don't see it all the time now, but I certainly saw it when I was working as a CFO in the US and it used to come up a lot when I was at Omicom as well, was, and I, and I think procurement yeah, briefs change over time as well. They get better and smarter, but, but, but often they're still very, very narrow. And you know, if you were looking at it from a sort of corporate perspective, the, the idea of putting more permanent staff onto a major international corporation's P&L into its operational uh, funding requirement by in-housing would be like pretty I mean it would be almost the last thing you want to do right now because it just fills your fixed cost base I'm sure as Miles says I mean it kind of stands to reason that procurement departments without wanting to break their supply chain will use this as an opportunity to uh, to go at people again I mean that's kind of that, that's their mandate they're, they're obliged to do that to you know as far as they can but I think the I think the the, the in-housing the in move I don't think is is helped by this situation. It puts too much fixed cost into organisations that are trying to get more flexibility. So I, I, th I think this gives agencies a bit of a chance to to try and slow that up and get a bit more creative about how they um, arrest that decline. Yeah, I've certainly seen in the, in one of the cases the agencies I'm involved in, we've been asked to put people into, as Miles suggested, into their market department because yeah. they've got degrees on uh, on headcount. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they need the and they need the resource yeah. to uh, to do that. Yeah. Simon, you're uh, you're pointing your pen at me. you are cut come off mute. Sorry, so I think I could. Uh, where are you? Yeah. I can't. Uh, Terry, can you get Simon off mute, please? Sure. Okay, you're off. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd echo uh, a lot of what's been said. Um, I think from our conversations with procurement people, um, the element of, of reducing risk is top of mind. Um, one of the other things that we're seeing is also the lack of time that they've got. Um, a lot of them don't just specialise in marketing services and they believe at the moment they've got bigger fish to actually fry but undoubtedly they're going to come back and um, an awful lot of the people that we've spoken to look at their agency relationships. Um, I think also what we've seen I mean we've had two inquiries from two very large multinationals um, in the last few days both saying the same story that they wanted to uh, a few months ago run their own um, agency relationship performance reviews and have now recognized they haven't got the time or the skill to actually do it so there's been incoming inquiries to us uh, on that which I think is is very very interesting um, the, the other point that I would sort of stress again that was mentioned earlier I mean clients are always in a perpetual way of restructuring their business but it's now never more important to actually understand what those clients are doing to actually restructure um, how they work because the best agency relationships are those that actually mirror um, how the client wants to work as opposed to how the agency wants to work. Yeah, 
And for those of you who don't know Simon, Simon's from Relationship Audits, did a great presentation on Friday. Um, and the point that he emphasised from their study is trust. So if procurement haven't got time to run a, uh, a pitch process or anything of that nature, they're going to lean towards those agencies who, who they are trusting most um, and have probably been good to them in, the, uh, yeah. in these difficult times. Ever since I was a new business guy in the agency world, I've always worked on the basis you give before you get. And you can't just expect clients to actually trust you. You've got to earn, you've got to earn that right. So the points that were made earlier about helping, helping the client formulate the business plan, providing them with relevant information. I think it's absolutely key that the information that you're giving clients is relevant. Um, then you're going to help build that trust. Yeah. Clearly, I mean, one of the uh, things that the industry has suffered from for too many years has probably been oversupply. Too many agencies chasing not enough business probably is the uh, way to do it. Um, is scale and um, critical mass still going to be at a premium? Jim, Miles? I, th I think that from an M&A perspective, y yes. Um, w if there was a there used to be a view of the marketplace which and and this not so much in asia but for north america and europe and most countries within western europe the one of the features of the marketing services industry as much as it's a really really hard industry to make a living in for successful businesses since about the mid 1980s it's been a complete conveyor belt for m a transactions that are generally favorably looked upon by local tax authorities. So if you can crack it, it's a good way of making money, albeit it's a hard living. And a very small percentage of agencies do manage to crack that particular code. So very, very high volumes of, of M&A activity that was predominantly playing into four or five global holding companies who had a formula which was buy business that can stand on its own two feet, that we can maybe help be a little bit better, but it can kind of look after itself. So we can have a small central management function to oversee these various different businesses. And, and, and so you got to about a million pounds of profit, about a million euros of profit, a million and a half dollars if you're in the US, and suddenly you become an acquisition prospect for one of the big holding companies. So there were lots of kind of, you know, lots and lots of small mid-scale businesses that would just drop into that, conveyor belt and the same people who sold that business onto that conveyor belt you know three years after they'd done deal number one would be out and looking for deal number two and some of them even managed three so i think th that buying model perpetuated the supply into the market for the last five years that buying model is pretty much gone well certainly it's it's disappearing pretty fast you know accenture were the first people to really challenge it and since then a whole bunch of other people have come in too and the private equity guys were already there disrupting that model but but now have kind of really cracked the cracked the code themselves and have started to have successful exits as well as investments so the the kind of acquisition model that's now behind most m a not being a <coughs> company deals is either much smaller companies that can be acquired and slotted in somewhere integrated which was a deal model that really, you know, hardly you'd see anything of 10 years ago, or it's much larger organisations that are being invested behind to, to be their own um, acquisition platforms. So I think it's, it's what you, it's, it's sort of not quite your question, Clive, but I think either you want real scale, proper scale, or actually scale is kind of your enemy. If you're mid scale, you're actually the least acquirable kind of business in the market. So you're either small, agile, and you are a team, or you're a specialism for someone, or you are someone's solution to problem X, and being in the middle is not a good place to be. Yeah, that squeeze middle has been uh, been there for, for, for some period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's still there, it's still there. Yeah. Miles, you were going to say something? Aren't you? You're on mute, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought I, I, yeah. thank you. Um, I did the same thing yesterday. Um, and um, yeah, I think from, from my perspective, you know, working, helping to businesses to, to grow and, and scale, I think it's, it's very easy, especially in the early days, to, 
to do as much as you possibly can for the client. Um, and you get into that, that situation where, you know, what you can do and what the client wants starts to sort of drift out of, out of, out of kilter and you start to diversify too much and then you, you start to be sort of more full, full service. Nothing, nothing wrong with being full service, but um, certainly, you know, if you start to diverge from what, what you want the, the client, what the client can, what the client wants and what you can offer is what we call death Valley. So you start producing services the client doesn't want anymore. Um, and that become that, you know, just creates a whole lot of problems for, for the business. But generally speaking, um, you know, the business I work with and, and certainly the proposition work that I do with, with, with agencies, where we're looking at, we're looking at some kind of specialism somewhere where they can hang their hat on something and call it their own. Um, and, and be really clear in the marketplace what you stand for and what you don't do. A lot, a lot of businesses don't do that. Um, it, it's quite odd when you look at, you know, I see a lot of websites and most websites say, you know, we have the best people, we have the best, you know, uh, data, we understand the customer than anybody else, they all say the same thing. Whereas really, you know, if you can, if you can craft that message um, and be much clearer about what you do and don't do, um, you're much easier to buy um, and then you can streamline your marketing, your operations all behind that, that, that thing. Um, and that, that creates the scale. You, you, you know, you create scale through, through what you're doing rather than just by adding and bolting on lots of different things, lots of different services. So I think there is a big advantage to, um, to, to you know, specialism. Uh, and as Jim said, you know, the, the acquiring market now is people are buying capability Rather than, rather than financial performance, so uh, an exit uh, with an exit of you know three to four years, and we're looking to um, you know focus around specialism um, that that somebody wants to buy. And clearly, we need to bring in you know what the buyer wants, uh, what the agency can achieve, um, and try and marry those two things together. But um, certainly, from the, the work that I do, it's that you're addressable market is too small to hit your financial um, targets. Okay. I mean, as I look at my screen, um, and I've, you know, we're on two screens, I look at uh, some of the names like uh, Jason Fu and Paul Efferenson and um, Jamie Matthews, um, some, some of the great entrepreneurs of our uh, industry. Um, where does the, uh, is this an opportunity for, um, for the independence to, strike out against a group model and I've been group I'm not just talking about the Omnicoms and the interpublics etc but I'm talking about anything which operates in terms of some kind of mini group structure caught up in a buy and build uh, yeah. Well, yeah, we, yes I mean yeah, un undoubtedly but but I think yeah great entrepreneurs are also um, also human beings, and that's a, there's there's a there's a lot for people to um, to have to process right now. I mean, maybe in three months' time, it you know it, it kind of gets more manageable, but I think now it's great entrepreneurs with with great teams around them can be really successful. But yeah, this is a kind of one man crusades will. Um, will kind of burn out pretty pretty fast i think with so many different challenges to to, to confront but um certainly there are lots of really good businesses with some great leadership teams who will, will definitely have um more opportunity and wider opportunity than they would have had going into this but but everyone's got to be able to continue to run existing business while 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 while, while expending quite a lot of effort energy and time on on that as well and that's I think that's where this sort of dynamic of time and risk appetite starts to need to reset first. Yeah. Has anybody got any, uh, any other topics, conversations that would like to, uh, to come in on, uh, on any of this? Um, we've covered a lot of ground and I've not heard from too many uh, people to, uh, to, to question um, either Miles or, uh, or Jim or I, Grill them, grill them further. Um, I mean, one one thing that's you know thrown my, through my mind, which is kind of a bit tangential, is are the likes of WPP in the sights of the private equity people now? 
Do you think in the next 12 months they'll get broken up? Yeah, I think WPP is a bit of a, um, it's, the, it's the hardest one to talk about really, given. I didn't mean specifically, I mean them, but I mean one yeah. of the groups. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think, are, are they acquirable now? Yes. I think, you know, there are, there are, there are, there are very sizable private equity funds who, uh, who, who could afford it. You know, they're affordable deals now. I think one of the one of the things that you do as an investor when you're, you know, in the same way when Bain is buying into Kantar, you, you have to think about well, what change can I affect in this business? Because I'm not going to own it forever. I'm going to own this thing for three to five years, and my fund will be built in a way that I have to triple the value of that, the equity value of that investment in the period in which I own it. So how how am I going to do that? And who am I going to exit this thing to three years from now? And maybe the exit is you just relist the thing. You kind of take it off the public markets, you clean it all up, and then when it's ready to go again, you refloat it. And you know, that would be all of those all of those large holding companies are of a scale where that would be possible. Uh, but very large public company deals, which are unlikely to be greeted with open arms by the boards, because I think that but they probably wouldn't be greeted with open arms by the boards. It's very difficult to get done. So I think there are, you know, whilst they're doable, there would be easier deals with easier strategic plans to put in place for the big private equity funds than, than taking on the marketing services groups. And I think, you know, if I'm sat at, I don't know, KKR, for example, I, you know, I might want to just see what Accenture can do in the market for the next year or two and see how much they get to reset it first. Probably makes my planning and me working out the value I'm prepared to to, to put on a business a bit easier to map. Even if I've got to chase them having a big head start, it's a bit clearer what I'm trying to build. So I think yeah, I, I, I'd probably be a bit lazy about it if I'm a big private equity fund and I might wait another year or two before I stepped in because I don't, you know, I don't think the world changes too much for the big holding companies in the next 12 months. It's about just coping with the situation they're in, bearing in mind the kind of situation they're in beforehand, which just pretty difficult for some of them so uh, yeah doable but I, I, I wouldn't I, I don't really expect to see that in the next year so do you think they'll continue to acquire smaller entities to um, fill in any gaps or bolster any of their uh, I mean I, I don't know when you were at Qtas miles but uh, you know business I was involved in Kit Kat and all came in and sat on top of Digitas because they were looking for uh, for the combination of skills to uh, uh, publicists or that way of fixing their, their problem in that particular area. Um, but uh, do you think more, more things like that might happen where they'll take on businesses to fix certain issues they've got within their groups instead of just hunkering down? I think, I think that's a, but it, it's a potential fix, but I mean, I guess, you know, that the, the the, the, probably the most famous one of those, in my mind, the most famous one in recent years in London would be Adam and Eve for DDB. Yeah. Hugely expensive for Omnicom. <laughs> Depends how you define expensive. You know, given, the, given the fix that it allowed them to achieve, probably pretty good value for money, ultimately, in terms of Omnicom shareholders. But fixing a kind of a different problem. I think if the, if the problem is fix leadership strategy offering in in one particular discipline in one particular market i think you can acquire for that but the fundamentals of the market prior to covid19 that everyone was wrestling with were a complete resetting of the way that the holding companies need to operate with their client base and actually putting more acquisitions into that mix makes that harder rather than easier so it might just not be possible i'm not sure that the problem that they're trying to fix now is a problem that is supported by m a and certainly yeah uh, it'd be an interesting question to ask of one of the corp dev teams at one of those groups but I, we I, I i wouldn't yeah i i think that's a struggle okay okay we've got the last uh, four minutes by my clock um any closing statements Miles? um i think just um I think just a bit of advice in terms of um, sales and marketing at the moment. A thing I'm asked a lot about is, you know, what do I do with my sales and marketing at the moment? There's less briefs out there. You know, do I furlough them? Do I, do I get them to sort of 
keep on trying to win stuff at the moment is just fix, you know, turning your, your, the attention of your, um, your sales and marketing teams to help with, you know, lead nurture and building brand equity. Um, I had a, a client the other day who, whose entire team has been sort of just focused on building um, the sort of, you know, like you're doing now, you know, webinars with, with, their, with their brands and prospects. And I think they had 150 brand managers attend to this, um, you know, it's, it's all on social, social media and what the social landscape was doing. I mean, that's a huge amount of engagement at the moment. Um, and clearly the message isn't about selling. And Simon mentioned earlier, in the give before you get, um, that's very much their philosophy and they're just giving lots of insight lots of sort of comfort and reassurance to, to brands at the moment and as a result they're building a huge amount of brand equity um, from which when the timing is right and when you know the budgets do start coming back they can start then taking advantage of but i think just you know doing what what you're selling at the moment might not be might be relevant right now it might not be um, that might change again in two months time might change again in six months time so just think very very carefully about services how you're selling yourself okay you've got a bit um, of a think sorry, about a bit of a, time and relevance on. um and um sorry am i cutting out yeah you are you are so um i think we got nobody means my kids have finished their lessons and they're on the broadband okay that's <laughs> what normally happens um but yeah, so um, I just think think very carefully about what you're what you're doing in terms of your outbound. You know, inbound's pretty much dead at the moment. You know, there's very few RFPs around. You can't wait for the phone to ring. You've got to be on the front foot, and you've got to really double down your outbound marketing channels and strategy. There, um, that's what I'd be doing at the moment. Okay, Jim. Uh, I think uh, okay, thirty second. Uh, Prey, predator, angels. Um, I, I think everyone, to, everyone to, to a greater or lesser extent, it should be should feel like they're somewhat in control of their destiny and try and be in control of it. As much as it's been a real shock and a, a real hammer blow for everyone in the last six weeks, M um, and A is a is a tool for everyone. I think to help get themselves out of this, no matter scale. I, I do think strategy, vision, leadership are the things that really drive. M&A and if anyone thinks that, 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 that that's something that's relevant to them I'm always delighted to talk to them. I think that's a great way to uh, end up and thank you Waypoint Partners that's a uh, very good overview of the uh, of the landscape that we are operating in now so thank you all very much thank you Jim thank you Miles thank you all for attending um, this is the MA, MAAG um, this is all part of our giving before you before we get so um, when time to come return please come back to us and uh, and sign up we are trying to build the uh, largest independent agency community because we're there to represent your interests so that's our ad it's exactly three o'clock um, so our hour is done thank you all very much indeed for your time and uh, we look forward to seeing you probably tomorrow when we've got another set of sessions so again finally miles jim and angela for organising all of this and Terry our Zoom master thank you all very much indeed thanks a lot thank you bye bye